very bad internet outage at, the, at this university for I don't know what reasons. And somehow we came back online this uh, uh, today, but my IDL is kind of screwed. So I was going to demonstrate a few uh, Chianti routines, but the only one I can do before uh, without crashing is only one, uh, the one about synthetic spectrum. So I will be giving my story on what can be done in terms of diagnostics and how Chianti can help. But in terms of demonstration, I will be able to only to give one example. So I'm sorry about that. This has been a problem which has going on since Sunday and it screwed up the beginning of the semester here. So let me try to, uh, okay, to share my screen. Let's see if it works. Okay. Okay. So can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So I will be discussing what type of plasma diagnostics can be done with, with, with visible lines in UCOP and how Chianti can help into that and what Chianti does and what Chianti cannot do. And then I will uh, demonstrate the, the one routine that I can actually demonstrate. So feel free to interrupt me anytime. I will just go through this presentation, but we're here also for discussion. So please interrupt me. So in order to do uh, some diagnostics, you first need to understand how the radiation that you're going to use is formed. And that depends on the wavelength range and the type of source you're looking at. With UCOMP, we are looking at the visible wavelength range and the off-disk off solar corona, which usually is very hot plasma. There is also prominences and colder plasma in CMEs, but by and large, it's hot plasma. So what type of radiation is coming from the source? And that is given by whatever you measure is given by three components. The first two, the uh, are two components that make up uh, spectral line intensities. And one is co a collisional component, and the other is a radiative component. And then there is also the continuum, and different processes are responsible for each. And I will go through these processes to highlight a few properties that, that can be used for diagnostics. So let's start for uh, with the collisional intensity. Now, this is the intensity, the type of intensity which is formed in the same way as the extreme ultraviolet X-ray intensity is normally formed. Essentially, uh, the exciting, you have an atom, and in order to um, emit the transition that you would see in the spectral line, it needs to be excited to a higher level. And for collision intensity, the exciting agent are in elastic collisions with free electrons. And in the solar corona, you have plenty of them. And the way you describe this intensity is the following one. First of all, radiation is usually, is usually optically thin. So whatever you observe at an instrument is actually given by the uh, um, integration uh, along the line of sight so that you sum simply every contribution given by every single volume elements in the line of sight. And that is the integration in dx, what that means. Now, each volume provides a contribution which is proportional to the square of the electron density and this function called contribution function, which sums up all of the atomic physics in, uh, involved in the process of line formation, plus also some properties of the plasma. Now, this contribution function, which is actually what is provided by Chianti, is made uh, by the product of several different components. The first one is the actual fraction of all the elements. Let's say we are looking at a line of element X ionized to the M plus level, say iron 13, which is 12 plus. So this term tells you the level the fraction of all these uh, uh, ions of iron 13, which is in the upper level J, which is the upper level of the transition from which the ion decays and emits the, the transition that we're looking at. The second term is the ion abundance, the total fraction of iron I, um, nuclei, if you like, which is ionized all the way to, uh, to iron 13. Then we have the abundance of the element. Basically, how many, what is the total number, the, ra the ratio between the total number of uh, the element X, say iron, relative to hydrogen. And then there are two more terms, where AJI is the Einstein coefficient, is an atomic physics uh, property typical of that particular transition, and it's essentially a number. And then there is the ratio between hydrogen and uh, the free electrons, and this is a function of temperature in the lower temperature plasmas, and then it's almost a constant in the solar corona. 
So there are two main things about this uh, collisional intensity. First of all, it depends on the square of the electron density. Now in the solar corona, the electron density decreases very, very quickly as you move out of the photosphere. And you can describe this decrease more or less as an exponential decrease. The fact that this intensity depends on the square of the electron density means that it goes down even faster. And this is why, for example, with the extreme ultraviolet imagers, spectrometers or so, you can only see up to a certain height in the, so, uh, in the solar corona when you see off disk, which is about normally 1.3 solar radii. And that's because this, this intensity, which is all that makes an, an EUV line, is all that there is and becomes too weak. And second, yeah, it decreases very quickly with distance from the limb. And this is one of the advantages, as we will see later, of having instruments that observe in the visible. Now, this intensity, that's the other uh, very important um, property, is that it depends on the electron temperature. It depends on it through the level population and the ion abundance. But most importantly, uh, the, the most important factor is the ion abundance. That's because ions, be it in ionization equilibrium or not, are formed within a certain range of temperatures. And uh, if you see then this line, it means that you're seeing the plasma at that particular temperature. If you are in equilibrium, you can predict that beforehand. Say, for example, iron-13 is more or less at 6.2 um, million degrees. If you are out of equilibrium, you need to get to have methods of understanding at what temperature that ion is formed in the particular situation you are, but still you're seeing that temperature. And this is for the collision intensity, but this is only one of the uh, possibilities of uh, intensities in the visible wavelength range. The other one being the relative intensity. And there are two components in it, two possibilities. One is resonance scattering. At this point, the exciting agent to bring the, uh, the ion into its exciting level is a radiation coming either from the disk or the inner corona. And that depends on the transition you are, uh, you are looking at. And for this one, you can describe this radiation in the following way. You have, in, uh, again, an integration along the line of sight because the, the radiation is uh, optically thin. And then you have the radiation is proportional to the incident uh, radiation coming from the sun. Of course, the brighter is the incoming radiation, the more intensity you will have. And then you have the number of absorbers. Now, these absorbers, actually, this is scattering, really. It's not even absorption. But anyway, the uh, number of, uh, which is uh, relevant here, is the number of absorbers in the lower level of the transition. And then again, you have the other two um, quantities that we've seen before, which is the uh, ion abundance and then element abundance. And then you have the so-called scattering phase function. This, this tells you on one side the uh, scattering power of the transition and also where the radiation is scattered to. Essentially scattering is a process where the, uh, the ion gets some radiation from a direction and scatter it in all directions. This quantity here tells you the fraction of this radiation which is scattered in the direction that you're looking at along your line of sight. And so this is a quantity that also depends on the relative direction of the incoming radiation and your line of sight. And so that depends also on the position in your line of sight, and this complicates things. Then you have the Doppler dimming term. Now, if radiation comes from a relatively a continuum and low, low, slowly varying uh, radiation with wavelength, this term is not that pro important. If it comes from a spectral line, it's very important because Say you have an, a solar wind ion which is accelerating away from the sun. This ion will see the sun is moving away from itself, and so the radiation that comes from the sun will be redshifted. And if, if the incoming radiation F has a profile, a spectral line profile, this line profile and the ion also has a line profile as an absorbing ion. As the ion gets accelerated away, so as the velocity increases, the two uh, special line profile, the two profiles will be shifted away from each other to the point that they will miss, be missing each other. So the faster the ion, the lower will be this uh, dimming term, and so the less uh, intense will be the radiation. In all of this, this radiation becomes important at large distances, 
And it's important for lines with a strong incident flux. They can be Lyman alpha, lithium like doublets for shorter wavelengths or for other lines as well. And what is important to note is that this radiation depends linearly on the electron density and not like an electron density squared. So with distance, it becomes more important relative to the collisional component. Then there is a second uh, way uh, to use radiation to uh, excite an atom and so generate spectral line intensity. And that's photo excitation from black body radiation. And that's ex extremely important for the lines observed by UCOMP. Now, this time the exciting agent is the, is the photospheric radiation, which is a black body radiation, so it's a continuum, peppered with a lot of absorption lines. Now, what happens is that this radiation gets this time absorbed by, uh, by the ion, and this absorption gets into the level population of the ion and gets treated in the same way as collisions go, uh, get treated. And uh, Chianti takes that into account. And the way to take that into account is to go from the Einstein's coefficient for spontaneous emission, which is for an ion and a level J, tells you the probability of this ion to decay through uh, the transition that generates a line, and modify that, including all the um, processes which uh, are involved in the interaction between ion and radiation. You have for excitation proper, where basically the power of the uh, yes, is that a question? No, door creaking. Sorry, said again. Uh, just the sound, background sound. No, not a question. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, this term here is for excitation. Really, what excites excites your atom is proportional to the should be proportional to the Einstein coefficient for uh, absorption. But with some math, you can reintroduce the spontaneous emission coefficient times the, the intensity of the, the radiation. And in this case, what survives is the exponential term of the, uh, of the black body radiation. Then there are some atomic constants here, the multiplicity. And then there is this quantity here, WR, which I will tell you about in a second. Then you also include spontaneous emission, which is emission caused by the presence of radiation, and then stimulated emission. Now, a spontane a spontaneous emission is the same as uh, for the extreme ultraviolet is whatever happens without a, an electromagnetic field. A stimulated emission is the one which is caused by the uh, incident radiation. Now, this, set, this third term back is um, normally uh, negligible. So really what you're left is the spontaneous emission as for collisional excitation plus this for excitation uh, term, which adds to the total excitation of the uh, ion. What happens with this radiation, I know, and this uh, function WR is the dilution factor. What that is, the black body intensity is actually an intensity, so it depends on the solid, uh, the total flux you get depends on the solid angle that the source is subtending at the receiver. And this dilution factor, factor gives you that uh, solid angle. So it will be smaller the larger uh, the distance so that this radiation also decreases with distance. But what happens is that this uh, uh, type of excitation is critically important for UCOMP and decreased coronal lines. And most importantly, it depends linearly on the electron density itself. And that's really, again, the power of a visible radiation excited in this way, because what you observe decreases with density much more slowly than the collisional component so in a sense, you will be able to observe the spectral lines, say, I don't know, iron 13, 1079, or um, iron 1078, or whatever. You will be able to see these lines for a longer range that you can, that, uh, the, the, uh, that you can observe the extreme ultraviolet lines emitted by the same ion. And so, and uh, this gives you an advantage so that you can, will be able to observe lines for a larger distance. And also, as we will see in a second, gives you also opportunities for plasma diagnostics. And then there is the third term. So far we discussed the line intensity, there is the continuum intensity. And this is essentially given by Thomson scattering of photospheric radiation. Again, the exciting agent is, photo, is the black body from the sun. But now the scattering agent is not anymore the ions, but are free electrons. And what happens, if you uh, want to account for it, you have several integrations, the usual integration around the line of sight, and then you have to integrate over wavelength and solid angle. Why is that? 
First of all, the intensity that is coming depends on wavelength, it's a continuum radiation, and also on the direction that um, it's coming from. And uh, this one, uh, the, uh, each of the three electrons sees this radiation being redshifted depending on their, on their speed. So you have to take into account when you want to consider the, the total uh, uh, radi scattered radiation, the distribution function of the three electrons. And since this distribution function is very broad, the photospheric radiation will be very strongly smoothed so that all the individual photospheric and chromospheric absorption lines will be wiped away and you will get a much smoother function. And you have to integrate over all the wavelengths to take that distribution function into account. Then you have the cross-section term, which really the cross-section the cross -section is essentially constant, but then you have the uh, scattering phase function, the probability of being scattering in your direction to take care of. And then eventually you will have uh, the density of the free electrons to integrate to because the more electrons you have, the more scattering you have. And again, this is a continuum radiation, but most importantly, like the photospheric, uh, the photo excited component of line intensities, this depends on the electron density only. So if you sum them all, uh, all of them up, this is more or less the spectrum I looks like, how it looks like as observed during an eclipse. And you see that the continuum line here is a photospheric black body, which has been strongly smoothed by the uh, velocity distribution function of the electrons. And superimposing to it, there are uh, lines, which are both either code lines, say H beta, H alpha, and coronal lines, which is eventually what you will observe. And these lines may look weak here, but say, for example, this little blip here is iron 1178 9G2, and this is the image observed in that very line during that eclipse. It's a very bright image. So this, and you can see intensity easily even in this uh, in this image, all the way at least 1.7 solar radii, which is way beyond anything that an extreme ultraviolet image or a spectrometer can observe. So this is what we will hope to observe with your comp. And uh, how can you use this uh, uh, this radiation to um, to do your uh, to measure pr plasma properties? The first and simplest of the um, diagnostics is line to continuum ratios. Now. If you do that, you can measure both with your comp, and if you do the ratio, you can decompose it in the ratio of the collisional component to the continuum and then the radiative component to the continuum. Now, we saw that the continuum depends on linearly on the electron density, the radiative component again linearly to the electron density, and the collisional component like a square with the square of the electron density. So really, if you do a little bit of math, you find that this ratio can be uh, decomposed with a, a term which depends, a linear term on the electron density, which is the collisional component, a constant term, which is the relative components, and then it would be proportional to the ion abundance and the element abundance. And here are a few examples, again, from an eclipse, which, uh, which show a sharp change in the, of the intensity as a function of uh, distance, whereby close to the sun, within 1.5, the density decreases very quickly with distance, and then it changes dramatically uh, the slope and start to decrease very little and then become constant. How can you use that? First of all, these ratios, we can see that it depends on the electron density, ion abundance, and the element abundance, and you can probe in, uh, get information on all of them. The relative size of the two terms allows several types of diagnostics, and that is, <clears throat> and we will see them. First of all, when you find the change in the excitation regime from a very strongly decreasing collisional uh, regime to the rate of decrease, if you do some modeling, you can actually find possible density diagnostic information. Sometimes you can measure localized enhancements. Now, these can be uh, interpreted in several different ways, depending on where you are. Let's see, essentially, um, interpreted, for example, as a change in the ionization status of the element. This is 7892, which is iron 11. It's very possible that they are, uh, you're seeing here in the solar wind, iron 11, iron 11 being formed at these distances so that their intensity becomes larger in a region where you have essentially um, a, radiative, uh, a radiative regime, and then being ionized out into iron 12 so that the abundance of this element is going down. 
And by doing modeling, you can actually try to uh, pin down the collision uh, processes that are co that are causing this uh, um, this change in uh, in abundance, and then to, uh, compare them with the models that you have, or you can um, make um, inferences about ion heating or so on and so forth. Then you can go into the radiative excitation regime, just in this region where the ratio changes very little or becomes constant. In this, this range, you get rid of the density dependence. So at this point, the ratio depends on the element abundance or the ion abundance. So say, for example, you're probing in a line of uh, in, in these um, plots, a region where you change from Say a streamer into the solar, into the into corona or whole area. You can expect to see that in a change of element abundance, especially for ions, uh, elements like iron, which are subject to the FIP effect. Or if you are looking into um, into the same region, say in corona holes at the poles, you can assume that the element abundance is pretty much the same. So any change that you see is actually due to the ion abundance. And this is extremely important because at this point you can measure how is the ion abundance changing with distance, and it, if it becomes constant, it means that the ion abundance is likely frozen in. And this frozen in value will at this point be the same that you will eventually measure in the, whatever in the heliosphere you have a, an in-situ measurement, an in-situ instrument. So this ratio depends on these two quantities, and you can determine the charge state evolution, especially like with UCOP, you have several ion, iron ions to be uh, to utilize, you can determine the frozen in values of the uh, of each of these uh, ions, and you can use that to compare with models or to compare with in situ data. Say, for example, with mo with an ionization model, this is iron ten plus, which is iron eleven. It's this curve which seems to be going in this plot. We have the ratio to the frozen in value of each of these uh, the ion abundance of each of these iron elements. The more or less froze, freeze in at around two point something, which is pretty much where this ratio is actually going constant. And you can see, and you can see that iron uh, eleven here is supposed to be pretty much frozen in even even before then at around this uh, this region, which is pretty much where this ratio becomes constant. And then these values can be compared with in situ measurements like this one. So you can have in this way a direct, especially with solar orbiter, when you can have multiple opportunities of having quadrature, for example, you can try to have a direct quantitative connection between remote sensing measurements on one side and in situ charge state measurements. Then, you, uh, in this case, line of sight integration, however, is an issue because to measure these line, uh, these line intensities, you have to integrate over all the, uh, the line of sight. What happens now? When you see many multi multiple ions, yes, is there a question? No background noise. Okay. Okay. So what happens when, like with UCOMP, you can see multiple lines. You actually, e e each of these lines is supposed to be forming in a relatively narrow temperature range. So uh, the, each of these observations will then show you all the, the, re uh, the um, structures which are emitted at that, which are basically at that temperature. And so you can start looking at a different structure, or if you see the same structure, to start measuring the electron temperature. These are a couple of examples from eclipses again. Iron 10 and 11 on the, on the top, where you see iron 10 dominates in corona holes, and iron 11 in a, more than one structure. Or iron 10 and iron 14, where you really see iron 10 dominating in colder structure, and you have, see much hotter structure with iron 14. What can you do with this? You have initial, uh, immediately large-scale simultaneous 2D temperature maps, and you can have large-scale thermal structure maps if you start to have the same, the same structure being seen in multiple ions. You can do simply uh, uh, intensity ratio between those ions. And then you can, if you have, like you put multiple observations time after time of the same structure, you can uh, you can study the temporal evolution of the coronal temperature over longer periods of time. So you can have 2D temperature resolved imaging of the extended corona to uh, distances much larger than you can have with the narrowband imagers in the extreme ultraviolet. And again, here, line of sight integration is an issue. 
Then what you can do, you can actually uh, utilize uh, diagnostic techniques to study the solar wind evolution. And you do that with codes that can predict the charge states like OSOM or the older mission organization code. So what you do with these codes, you input plasma parameters as a function of distance. You actually input them in the, into the mission organization code. OSOM calculates this automatically by itself. Uh, all you need is the electron density and temperature, which determine the local ionization um, rate and recombination rates everywhere along the wind trajectory, and the velocity of the wind, which uh, tells you how much time the wind plasma parcel spends at every position. Then you set some boundary condition for the source region, and you need what Chiantip can provide you, a database of ionization and recombination coefficients. So what you do, you calculate the charge state, state evolution everywhere in the solar wind trajectory. And this is, and you can use that now to um, pre, uh, compare with two different types of, um, uh, of instruments. These are examples of such predictions for neon and iron ions. You can see as a function of 1.0 is the solar photosphere. Ions get ionized in and then get ionized out, and so they decrease in abundance. Some ions instead, uh, uh, oh, sorry, some ions survive where well, the freezing and they still are uh, significant, they're observable uh, once they're frozen in, and so on and so forth. So, how do you use these results? You can calculate the observables. For the in situ, that's just the final frozen in values that you get from such an ionization code or from uh, OSOM. You can directly compare them with uh, in situ measurements. And with OSOM, it is particularly useful because OSOM can predict everything everywhere, so wherever solar orbiter or A's are, you can actually predict the values at that position. And then you can calculate spectral line intensities, both the collisional and the radiative one. And that's because for the collisional ones, electron temperature and density allow you to determine the contribution function, and then you have the ion abundance from the code. So you can predict non-equilibrium line intensities, which is what now you did talked about, what you can do with awesome. And then you can also predict the radiative component. Again, you can uh, calculate the element, uh, the population of the lower level, and again, the ion abundance. And you compare them, and so the level population can be obtained with Chianti, the ion abundance from the ion composition model or from Osom, and then the element abundance, you assume some, because that is supposed to be constant in this game. So you can compare now with both, uh, with both types of instruments. Here you have your line of sight. This can be a space instrument or you come here uh, on the island. You are looking through a line of sight. You integrate along the line of sight and you measure and you determine the, uh, um, the expected behavior of the um, spectral line intensity with distance from the limb. And then from the charge state in situ measurements, you determine the charge states. Now here, the blue lines on top of this uh, are the, and uh, in this course here are the predictions. And then you have the measurements. Here, uh, I assume a, a whatever model, and the model doesn't, isn't, isn't able to, uh, um, to reproduce observations. So there can be either I can change the model and, and determine an empirical model that allows me to, um, to determine, uh, to, to, to reach a better agreement, or I can benchmark my uh, theoretical model and then try to improve the model itself. Again, you have a line of sight interracial issue though. Now, you, have actually, you can actually dispense from this uh, uh, line of sight integration doing tomography. Now, tomography is a technique that basically allows you to reconstruct the 3D distribution of a source, be it an absorbing or an emitting source, if you observe it from multiple uh, directions. Now, as you can observe uh, the sun every day, the sun rotates, and by rotating, basically shows itself at, from different vantage points, as seen from Newcom. And so you can reconstruct the 3D uh, distribution of the emission of the sun as far as you, uh, you can observe at this, up to distance until you get enough photons. And then this, uh, you can, uh, this now, at this point you have the line intensity from UCOMP and even the continuum intensity if you have enough everywhere in 3D. And so you can apply all the diagnostics we discussed to individual boxes rather than to line integra of such integration issues. This is of the shelf technology, so, so it has already been applied to white light observations and UV narrowband images, which, however, have uh, limitations in their diagnostic uh, uh, capabilities. 
Now, UCOMP will be able to observe spectral lines, meaning that now you can have this type of current maps, if you like, of the, um, of the solar corona and in individual line intensity. So you can have the full potential of line spectroscopy and diagnostic techniques applied to every individual voxel. So this will uh, open an entire, an entire new uh, window into the solar corona uh, diagnostics because you will be able to uh, study the temporal evolution of, ten of uh, the temperature of individual structures in 3D. You can, uh, um, you can eliminate the line of sight integration and study really uh, corona holes without having the fear of having streamers in the in the foreground or the background you can separate streamers from pseudo streamers around along the line of sight and so you can really do diagnostics in an entirely new way and if you combine them with global magnetic field models like also or any other model you can actually even follow the charge state evolution along individual field lines and apply the wind diagnostic technique that i discussed to the same plasma of plasma from wherever, say, solar orbiter is, all the way to the source region. And so you can really directly connect the local and diagnostics like with UCOMP or anything else with in-situ measurements. And then, okay, all of this is using line intensities. Then, of course, UCOMP observes also line profiles, meaning line widths and centroids. So with the uh, centroids, you can measure Doppler velocities, so they give you the line of sight, and through multiple subsequent images, you can try to follow individual plasma passes, if you can distinguish them, in the plane of the sky. And this allows you 3 d reconstruction of um, the trajectory. And this is very good for CMEs, which allow you to determine absolute acceleration, interaction with nearby magnetic structures, and so on. From line widths, you can determine solar wind heating, uh, by uh, studying ion cyclotron waves, individual ion heating, and uh, you can study, for example, whether uh, undamped waves are uh, reproduced by observations of the line width decreases with height, like it was found by Mike Han, and more recently by Ying Ji, who has done uh, a lot of work into this, um, into this topic. You can determine the height of wave dissipation, whether there is wave dissipation at all, you estimate, can estimate energy release, and so on and so forth. And you can even study the presence of shock. You can determine location of shocks through the big broadness of the spectral lines and measure the effects on local plasma. So there is a lot of things that you can do with this type of measurements. Is there any question? No. Okay. So how can Chianti help in all of this? Now, first of all, what is Chianti at all? It's an experiment lasting 30 years. With this, when I was an undergrad student myself, started developing Chianti. And back then, we needed a large amount of atomic data because the, new, the next generation of instruments, software, was being launched. And then there was a lot of uh, users which were increasing. And the strength of Chianti of a database per se was uh, because it allowed to streamline the process of calculation of predicted line intensities. And this was very important at the time because uh, uh, before the presence of these databases, every single scientist had to find their own uh, atomic data and uh, basically develop their own routines to calculate line intensities. This was done by people, solar physicists, which were not necessarily atomic physics experts, and uh, there was, and this would, could create problems. The implementation was very time consuming, and there were a lot of software duplication. And the the problem was that whenever two different people found two different results, it was possible that this was, this was not because the model were different or the physics was different, but just because they were using different atomic data. So Chianti solved all these problems and provided a, a platform that everybody could use, could use that spared the people the hassle of building their own atomic code. And basically everybody was using the same thing, so differences were likely you due to uh, plasma physics and solar physics rather than atomic physics. Chianti needed to be complete, needed to be accurate, and we have spent a lot of time over 30 years to try to improve it. User-friendly, and unfortunately, I won't be able to show you how user-friendly Chianti will be because of the software problems I, ha I have here. And needed to be transparent because uh, Chianti is not a black box and everybody can 
uh, the, uh, look at what type of data are inserted in and make their own decisions on whether these data are good enough for them or not. Now, uh, Chianti uh, was open, or, um, developed to be comp compact, and pro compact and most importantly, freely available. So everybody can use it either through SolarSoft or downloading it, and we will see it in a second. And so that it uh, can be used with no, uh, no hardware. Now, Chianti is a complete spectral code. It includes data from more than 280 ions, atomic data for uh, the individual ions, the Einstein coefficients that we were talking about, energy levels, and then electron and proton ion collisional data to calculate the collisional component. And then with the A values, you can calculate also the relative components, data for calculating the continuum, and also ionization and recombination data to calculate ion fractions, be it in equilibrium or non-equilibrium. And then we provide the software to read and handle all this data, to carry out plasma diagnostics, and uh, to calculate synthetic spectrum. And unfortunately, all, today, we, I will only be able to demonstrate you the synthetic spectrum calculation. Now, Kiant includes the following processes, electron and proton collision excitation, photo excitation, it doesn't include the relative scattering, so for very la uh, large distances, it's not really suited. And then for extremotraviolet and most importantly, X-rays includes also inner shell, the electronic satellite lines, and recombination into excited levels. And total ionization and recombination rates for calculating ion fraction, be it in equilibrium or non-equilibrium. CAT is optimized below 2,000 angstroms, but it includes any spectral line beyond 2,000 angstrom of your interest to decrease or you pump. So <clears throat> the Chianti can be really applied very easily to this new instrumentation. Now, everything is freely available on the web in this, at this website, and we will be uh, looking at that in a second. And this is for the standalone version. And then it's distributed through SolarSoft for the IDL and on GitHub for the Python version. The two versions do exactly the same thing, but since they are two different languages, they're developing in a different way. And I'm most familiar with the ideal versions. And everything is fully documented through user guides that you can find in this website. And we'll see that uh, later. And we also have a Google group. We provide email assistance. You can send an email to this, uh, um, this uh, email address anytime and somebody will answer you. Uh, give you an answer and hopefully solve your problem. And to be registered, you just send an email to Peter Young. This is his email. And so you can get inserted and you will get announcement and any support you need. So how do we use Chianti? First of all, there are several ways of using Chianti. First of all, what does actually Chianti do so that eventually you know how to use it? It can Chianti calculates line intensities and also the continuum. So it solves for the uh, contribution function in the collisional regime uh, by changing the integration from distance along the line of sight into temperature, introducing the differential emission measure, which basically tells you the distribution of plasma along the line of sight as a function of temperature. And the Chianti calculates the contribution function, calculates level population as a function of temperature, electron temperature and density, calculates the ion abundance, and it does it under equilibrium, but it provides all the data to calculate non-equilibrium ion, uh, ion fractions. And it calculates it as a function of the electron temperature. It has files for the element abundances, and also it calculates the ratio between protons and free electrons. This ratio is a function of temperature in the transition region and below. It's almost a constant in the corona. And then it provides all the values for the Einstein coefficients. Now, Chianti uh, assumes that the plasma is optically thin. It doesn't have any relative transfer code, but you can use Chianti data for your own relative transfer codes. All level population are assumed to be in statistical equilibrium, and this assumption holds even in the world, normally, even in the world, in the fastest events like flares. But assume that, that elements are in ionization equilibrium, and this does not hold in the solar wind, in CMEs, in many conditions. However, the user can use their own ion fractions, and they can calculate time-dependent ion fraction using the Chianti data. Although we don't have Chianti software for calculating time-dependent, you have to develop your own. And also, Chianti does not have any magnetic field effect. 
So if you want to do magnetic field measurements, you have to use other codes like forward or other. So Chianti is not for magnetic field measurements. Having said that, you can use Chianti in many ways. For the people that do want to do their own ways, say they have their own abundance, they have their own ion fractions, they want to use their DEM, or they even want to use the data file for individual ions because they have better atomic uh, physics calculations, you need to mimic the Chianti file format for your data, but once you do that, you can simply insert them into Chianti. In order to do that, you have to download the latest Chianti uh, version from the web page and put that in whatever directory you would like to use. And you store everything there, you unpack and tar everything in that direction. And then once you go into IDL, you tell the where, IDL where you put your database through the program use underscore Chianti. And all you need to provide is the name of this uh, directory. At this point in this directory, you can put whatever you like. You put the abundance file in the abundance directory, then they will automatically pop up in the selection of the choices of the Chianti software. So it's fairly uh, straightforward to do, to do that. Otherwise, there are people who can only be interested in the data, say people with relative transfer code or people with their own databases that they want to compete with Chianti. Chianti provides software to read the data and basically ingest them and then have them available on the prompt. You can read atomic data and relative rates with the these two programs. You can read the electron and proton collision rates with the, this uh, routine, which reads the scale collision rates present in Chianti. And with this program, you can calculate collision rates at any chosen temperature. You can read uh, all the other data, the differential emission measure, the ionization equilibrium files, the abundant files. All these programs are in the Chianti uh, software, to, uh, software suite or in, in SolarSoft. And you can also read ionization and combination rates for your ionization code with these two programs. And they're really straightforward. And each programs are very fu fully documented in the header, so you can re really master them in really no time. And then we are going in for the remainder of this time to, the, to do the very little the demonstration of the Chianti software. And for this, I will first call the Chianti, um, what's called the Chianti web page, which is here. So let's take my email out and you go into Chianti, the Chianti web page where you can download uh, the whole thing is here. Can you see it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. You can do several things here, but the most important one are the download. If you want to download, either the Chianti software or the Chianti data. You click here and you have the latest, that's not very beautiful to see, but you have the latest database file, 10.1. You download it, you put it wherever you like, you unpack it and everything is ready for the use. And then you have the Chianti uh, routines. You have the ideal version, 10.1 or 10.2, you always take the, the latest one and you have instruction for installation. And then you also have the Python one through GitHub and uh, or also in this place. So you can download which version you prefer. Then if you go back to the main one, you can also access the individual Chianti data here. You go, the, uh, you click, you can access either the Chianti IDL software, the one in SolarSoft or the data files. And the data files are organized by uh, ion. Different colors are different isoelectronic sequence. Let's say we want iron 13, that's here. You click it and you have the atomic level file, the relative uh, data file, and then the collision of data file. And here is the uh, bottom of the file where the original sources for the, uh, for the data is uh, reported for those who are interested in it. And then you can have, where is it? I'll go back. The uh, user guides, which are very important for those of you who want to learn better counting. Now, you see version eight, version nine, they look like older. Actually, nothing changed in the physics of Chianti and in the, the handle of the files since these versions. So you can just use them confidently and they will tell you the basics that I just told for diagnostics and also what is in the Chianti files, what is, uh, what are the approximations, how to use them and so, and so on. So they're pretty complete, especially the complete one is kind of an encyclopedia. You can find all the information you need here. 
Any question? Okay. So what I would have liked to um, to show you are the routine uh, the routine for synthetic spectrum calculation ch underscore ss and the two the main diagnostic uh, procedures the one for measuring the electron density and the one for measuring the electron temperatures. These last two don't work, so today we will not be seeing them. But I can show you how this one works, so you get a feel on how or what Chianti can do. And all these other routines here are actually line common line routines which are called directly by ch underscore ss so this is really the main routine that you would uh, that you want to use so let's look at it and to look at it i will put it in my screen so we are in solar soft here and they're just called ch underscore ss and the program just makes a lot of mess and here is what pops up this routine calculate is meant to calculate the an entire synthetic spectrum. And it does that in two steps. The first one here calculates uh, level populations and uh, inserts the ion fractions under the assumption of equilibrium. And the second one allows you to play with the spectrum to visualize it, to include continuum radiation, and also to choose the abundances that you want. So I will walk you through the use of this uh, routine. First of all, let's use the wavelength, uh, let's choose the wavelength range. Let's say we want the u comp wavelength range, and to be generous, we will do 1500s to 1100s, and this is in angstroms. So this is uh, okay. Then you choose the the density, and you um, can choose either constant density or a constant pressure, or you can insert your own function of electron density and temperature if you have a model of your atmosphere. We will choose. And whatever density, say 10 to the 8, typical quite some corona, uh, quite some uh, thing, quite some uh, of this corona. And then you choose the ion fractions. Here is where, if you have your own data set of ion fractions, say for example, non equilibrium, here is where you can pick it. You can have either from the Chianti direct, uh, directory, the, Chia the standard, the, um, uh, the regional Chianti file calculated with the latest data. Or you can select a file with the widget, and that's where you will pick the files that you have wherever you um, you have stored it. Or if you have put it in this directory and you have the standalone version, you will see it popping up here. So let's take the standard Chianti one. Then here it asks you whether you want to see all the ions or just selected ions. Since all the ions take some time, we will just select iron ions, the relevant iron ions. So you have the selection of all the ions in the Chianti database. V means the electronic lines, you're not interested into that for you pump. Say iron nine, iron 10, then you choose iron 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. And let's say we are, uh, we are happy with this selection. So you say, okay. The here it asks you whether you have want all the lines, so meaning that all lines mean all lines for which we have a uh, measured wavelengths. Chianti calculates all possible transitions, whether they have ever been observed or not. If you say yes, it will give you everything it has. If it says no, if you say no, it will go, give you all the lines for which we have a secure wavelength. Normally I say yes, because uh, it's better to know everything. You can use lookup tables, which speeds up the calculation but we will not do that today. Here it tells you, it asks you whether you have a diff, you want a differential emission, emission measure, so you have a multi-thermal plasma along the line of sight, or you have an isothermal plasma for which you calculate, uh, you, you input the, the temperature and the emission measure value. Let's say you want the DEM. This is another place where you can use your own files. These are the files that Chianti provides for you, just uh, example files and with this one you can choose whatever you like let's say we want an active region so it shows you the actual active region dm this is for the for the disk so it's not actually good for uh, for ucomp so let's say for ucomp we want an isothermal plasma 6.15 and that's it then here it asks whether you want photo excitation or no and this is critical for ucomp you will have to say yes but at this point you will have to tell them the distance at which you want the uh, radiation you are observing, say 1.3, uh, 
and the temperature of the black body and for the sun is 5770. And then you choose the, the units, ergs or photons. And then you just, you choose whether you want to, to choose proton ex collision or excitation or excluded. Normally for, unless you are in flares, doesn't make very much of a difference. I always include it because it doesn't hurt. And then you calculate the intensity. Here it just compiles a lot of stuff and then starts to calculate ion by ions, all the lines which are included in this wavelength range. And then it does. Now, you can just save your um, calculation either in an ideal file or in a FITS, in a FITS file. And you can just, if you just want to utilize the second part, you can restore the previous calculation so that you don't have to go to this, uh, to this step. Now let's, uh, now we have calculated it or we have restored it. We go to the second part. Again, it tells you, here it asks you whether you still want this wavelength range if you, or if you want to focus to a smaller one. And here you're going to plot the spectrum. So you will cho choose the bin and the full with a maximum of a spectral line. And let's keep the, the values that you, this is all in angstrom. Let's keep this uh, uh, value. Then it asks you whether you want to calculate the continuum. The continuum count is free free, free bound or Q photon, none of which is very important for, uh, um, for you comp. So in this point, we will say no, because it's kind of useless to, to waste time in calculating them. Unfortunately, you um, Chianti doesn't have uh, the Thompson scattered um, continuum from the photosphere. Again, we want all, to plot all the lines, tells you what that means. And then here is the other place with that, where you, if you have your own data set, you can use it. Chianti, this, you, here you choose the abundance. So you choose the... Uh, we provide a few examples, or you can select your own file with widgets, with a widget. So you can, if you choose it, you just need to go into the directory that you, where you have placed them and read it. So we will just say, let's go, let's use coronal abundances. And then you just calculate the spectrum. You can still change the unit if you like, we will keep erg. And this guy does the calculation and here he plots it. Now for this plot, you can choose whether to have the labels. It tells you iron 14, iron 10, this is uh, iron 11, iron 13 down here, or you can omit them. But if you keep them and you click on this line, it tells you here the intensity, the units, and the transition, which is good in case you, uh, you want to identify a line that you don't know anything about. You can change the minimum for which the line is displayed. Say, for example, we go down, come on, Okay, doesn't seem to be very responding, C3, E to the minus four. Okay, you can have even more lines included in Kianji. So here we have the standard iron 10 line and then other lines which are much weaker, but they're still there just in case you want to know whether there is anything else. And the lines for which you can say yes or no are the so-called unobserved lines for which, which are marked by an asterisk, this is a theoretical wavelength, so it's not very reliable. And then, okay, uh, you can uh, create a uh, portrait file of this figure, and you can uh, and you can uh, save the line details either in LaTeX, which is good for papers, or in the or in uh, ASCII file, or you can save the spectrum calculated as a function of wavelength in these files. So this is pretty much it for the demo, and unfortunately, sorry, I couldn't demo anything else for uh, for the software. And this is pretty much all I had today. Are there any questions? Hi, Enrico. I had a simple one. Do you yeah. guys plan on targeting lines more in the infrared? Because you said you kind of stop at uh, 2000. Let's say the, uh, in the off this corona, the lines that you're interested in are corona lines and they should all be already there in Chianti. Those with that we miss and the visible are those for the photosphere and the chromosphere for which you do really do have more, uh, ions like neutrals or singly ionized, which are not in Chianti. We are not yet planning to go 
into those aisles. But as far as leakage and you are concerned, we pretty much have all the lines which are needed. Thank you. Yes. Uh, will the um, IDL and Python or these is the same functionality implemented in both, or is Python still kind of catching up with what you have in IDL? No, Python is actually as functional as IDL. Okay. It has to say, okay, you can do the same things. You do you will do that in a different way because the language and the programs are structured in a different way. But they, they do the same thing. Another question and recall. So you when you're talking about the radiative component of the intensity, you mentioned uh dropper damming being um, important in certain cases. I can imagine also dropper brightening, maybe if like some other emission line like it's shifted out to the wavelength range. Are there any lines in UCOM where that might uh, be important? I don't think so because that is particularly important. So this makes me brings me to mind the oxygen six doublet at, um, in the ultraviolet in the tumor ultraviolet, where you are beginning to get out of the original line profile, but then other lines get in. For you, photo excitation is essentially a photos uh, caused by photospheric radiation, and this means that even if you shift, you may have. Now you basically don't really increase change very much the, in the pumping uh, radiation. You may go towards a higher, uh, higher, um, re, uh, larger regions in the in the black body in the black body curve. But there won't be very much of a change because the wavelength shift that you will have is relatively limited to the velocities uh, that we have. So in principle, yes, it can pro provide a Doppler enhancement if you like. But that's not very, uh, if there is any, it's probably not uh, not visible. Any, anyone else? All right. Thank you very much.